After Walt Disney's passing in 1966, the studio went through a dark era of flops. The 70s and 80s were so critically and financially bad for Disney, it was very close to dissolving and being sold. 1989 became their revival year, with the release of the huge hit The Little Mermaid. And just like that, Disney was back in business. We all know the story of The Little Mermaid. Ariel falls in love with a human prince, and Ursula stops at nothing to foil the young girl's plans for marriage. Luckily, Disney's signature style is the happily ever after ending, so it turns out pretty well for everyone except Ursula. But believe it or not, the original tale of The Little Mermaid is not so happy. It is definitely not for the faint of heart. In fact, we have to put a disclaimer here. This tale is pretty mentally scarring, so listen at your own risk. It's closer to a horror story than a fairy tale. It was written by Danish author Hans Christian Andersen back in 1837, the man responsible for fictional folklore such as Thumbelina, the Ugly Duckling, or the Ice Queen, the story that inspired Disney's Frozen and is a whole other Disney dark secret of its own. So exactly how much of the Little Mermaid story did Disney cover up for their theatrical release? Well, allow me to shine some light in that subject. Hi, this is Frank James Bailey with Channel Federator, and today we're going over some of Disney's darkest secrets. The secrets that were so upsetting they were locked inside a vault inside the Disney vault. So prepare yourselves. We're diving in deep to explore the tragedy that is The Little Mermaid. <laughs> A Kingdom Under the Sea The setting begins the same, a kingdom at the bottom of the sea run by a powerful king and his royal family. The king remains nameless, but is referred by the general term Sea King. The name goes unspecified, as with the rest of the characters in the story, whereas the Disney version names everyone, including the Little Mermaid's father, who is King Triton. The Sea King in this tale is a lonely widower with five lovely daughters, all of which were born one year apart from the last. The Little Mermaid is the youngest of the five, and as a mere ten-year-old, she becomes jealous of her older sisters who are allowed to visit the surface. Still looking out for their younger sister, the mermaids return with many tales of the surface and of humans. They develop a fascination with people and how they live, often collecting items of theirs that are lost to the ocean, including the sailors themselves. Unlike any Disney kingdom you might have seen, the underwater kingdom in this fairy tale is littered with the bloated, rotted corpses of lost seafarers. Sailors would drown, and their bodies would sink down to the castle below. Since there is no cleanup crew described, one can only assume their remains stayed there. The really messed up part is that human contact isn't at all forbidden. Mermaids don't rescue people because they think the humans just wanted to visit their kingdom like a friendly neighbor. They call out to the drowning victims, often in an attempt to welcome them. Unfortunately, their calls are interpreted by the human ear as unworldly shrieking, kind of like Harry Potter and a Goblet of Fire, so it isn't the most comfortable noise to hear while struggling for dear life. The Royal Family Although their mermother is no longer around, their grandmother is still a big part of their lives, and she also serves as a matriarch of the community. She maintains a very close relationship with her granddaughters and often spends time with them, explaining the way of their world and how it differs from the world above. The Little Mermaid learns everything about the human lifestyle from her own family, not quirky seagulls, crabs, or flounders. In fact, there aren't any sea companions tagging along with the mermaids. The marine life in the kingdom works similarly to how it does now, but the mermaids have a certain skewed perspective in some regards. Like for instance, they refer to fish as birds, still not so far off as thingamabobs or dinglehoppers. Mermaids are also described in this story as having a certain class system involving oyster shells being clipped to their tails as a status symbol. Royal daughters of the kingdom that have become of age are granted eight shells to designate their high rank as daughter of the king, while the grandmother matriarch wears the most at twelve, and everyone in the kingdom has but six. It's a minor detail, and no real wonder why it's usually overlooked, but it's rather interesting. Still, the most important order, set forth by the underwater kingdom, declares that no mermaid shall visit the ocean's surface until their 15th birthday, at which point it is allowed, but at a mermaid's own risk. So, obediently, the little mermaid awaits her 15th birthday, never journeying to the surface in accordance with her father's demands, like a good little fishy, as opposed to the disobedient 16-year-old we see in the Disney version. The Prince Finally, the big day arrives, and the Little Mermaid is old enough to journey to the surface. Upon her arrival, she's drawn by a nearby ship, bellowing with the joyous sound of laughter and music. She swims up to the ship and immediately lays eyes on a dashing young prince who seems to be celebrating his 16th birthday. Instantly, the Little Mermaid falls in love with him and stalks the young man for several hours. No joke. Finally, the party ends, and the ship sets sail. In the trance, the mermaid follows. A storm rolls in, and lightning cracks the ship twice causing major panic among its crew, very similar to the Disney story's destructive storm. And like most mermaids, this tale's mermaid princess
princess watches as a chaos ensues, but doesn't get involved until she notices her dear crush is missing. In a panic, she searches the ocean until she finds him struggling for air. The prince passes out, and the Little Mermaid grabs him and carries him to shore, just as Ariel does in the Disney version. They arrive at the shoreline by dawn, and oncoming passersby causes a sudden goodbye before the prince could regain consciousness. Upset by the lack of a formal introduction, the Little Mermaid wallows in sadness for many months before confiding in her grandmother. The grandmother explains very clearly to the young princess that her dreams can never come true because humans and mermaids are different spiritually. She tells her granddaughter that mermaids have no soul. They live for about 300 years and they just randomly turn into sea foam. Humans, however, do have souls and they continue to live in another realm when they die. A mermaid can only attain a soul through marriage to a human. As if this wasn't already a tough pill to swallow, the grandmother really discourages the little mermaid by saying he will never love her because of her half-fish self. To a prince, her body would be absolutely revolting. Grandma's always doing the right thing to say, right? Enter the Sea Witch. Obviously, the Little Mermaid is distraught by this new information. Not only is she considered disgusting by human standards, and therefore also to the man of her dreams, but without a soul, she's gonna die someday and turn to foam. How unsettling is that? Her cries attract the attention of her sister, who, unlike the Disney version, generally cares about her happiness. The Little Mermaid tells her sister about falling in love with a prince, and to her surprise, the sister actually recognizes him from the description. As it turns out, she followed the ship one day out of boredom and can recall seeing it return to a kingdom by the sea. So, the sister revealed the castle's whereabouts to the little mermaid so that she could watch her love from afar. Eventually, the mermaid grows weary of the distance. Once idle obsession takes its toll, the little mermaid decides to visit the sea witch in hopes of exploring her options to pursue the prince whom she so longs to meet. She swims down to the cold, dark abyss where she finds the witch's lair, built from sunken remains of human flesh flesh and bone. She's evil, but she's also eco-friendly. And this is the one and only time we encounter the Sea Witch in this tale. But it seems that Disney thought that she would be a great antagonist to drive the entire plot in their version. And we're kind of glad they did. Ursula is a great character. The Real Curse The witch is no real antagonist in this story. She has no ulterior motive or even holds envy over the Little Mermaid. Very different from our greedy, power-hungry Ursula who wants to rule Triton's kingdom. To the contrary, the Sea Witch is very upfront about the terms of the curse and even warns the mermaid several times, giving her multiple opportunities to swim away scot-free. Unfortunately, the princess is persistent, and the terms are clear and unforgiving. The witch talks about a potion, instructing that the mermaid must drink it upon the shore. Once the potion is ingested, her tail would become legs, but it wouldn't be an easy transformation. Pain and agony would feel nothing short of mutilation, as though someone took a rusty dagger to her tail. Then, to make matters worse, this pain would continue with every step she makes on land. Sure, she would be viewed as beautiful, elegant, and graceful, but to simply walk with her new legs will feel as though she were stepping on blades, like her feet becoming chopped to bits. Oof, rather graphic, huh? The terms continued, and somehow the Little Mermaid remained on board, sort of speak. The princess would never be allowed to change back. Once a human, she would either gain the affections of the prince and thus gain a soul, or her heart would literally shatter into pieces and she would die and become sea foam by dawn the next day, should he decide to marry someone else. Oh boy. Well, the Little Mermaid insists on following through with the deal. She's clearly crazy about the prince because she signs herself up for a world of hurt. Literally. Before the sea witch makes the potion, she ensures the mermaid that all things come at a price. Surely she wasn't expecting to trade the potion for nothing. So, the final price to pay for her true love? The witch requests the mermaid's voice. But there's no magic involved here. Instead, the sea witch pulls out her blade and claims the mermaid's tongue as payment. Ouch! So much for the famous, ah! Medley, as we know Ariel for, a slave for love. The Little Mermaid is awoken on the shore the next morning. As she sits up and looks down, she takes notice of her stunning new pair of legs. Thinking back, she vaguely recalls the events that took place the night before. After retrieving the potion, she followed the witch's instructions perfectly, resulting in this agonizing transformation that was promised. Apparently, the pain was so intense, it caused her to pass out on the beach and sleep through the night. Suddenly, a voice calls out from behind her. She turns to see her beloved prince standing before her. As the two lock eyes, the prince is immediately enchanted by this mysterious beauty on his beach. He takes her home and cleans her up, but her stay at the palace is no vacation. 
prince makes the mermaid live, work, and eat with the royal servants, not as similar as we thought to our Disney do-gooder prince. One night, the servants put a show on for the prince, showcasing their attractive talents. When the little mermaid decides to vie for his affections in competition with another servant woman who has an obviously captivating singing voice, although it feels as though she is dancing on a thousand needles, the little mermaid displays such grace in her dancing that she quickly gains the attention of the prince, becoming his favorite girl. As mentioned, Prince in this story is nowhere near as gallant and shrivelous as Prince Eric in the Disney classic. He is almost unlikable in that he is completely self-involved and not very considerate of others. It almost makes you wonder why the Little Mermaid was so infatuated with him in the first place. However, nothing could change her feelings toward him, and at this point, she has already bet her entire existence on their love, so there is no turning back. Luckily, the relationship between the two finally progresses. The prince takes a liking to her and makes the Little Mermaid his personal servant. He's even kind enough, if you want to call it that, to offer the princess her own doggy bed outside of his living quarters. Okay, okay, it was a big pillow, but still. If that's not romantic in this dark story, I don't know what is. A bittersweet romance. As time goes by, the prince and the little mermaid become nearly inseparable. The two do everything together, even activities that painfully agonize the mermaid, such as long hikes throughout the surrounding mountains. At night, the little mermaid manages to sneak away and rest her feet in the ocean when she is spotted by one of her wandering sisters. The sister begins visiting on occasion, and eventually she brings the grandmother and father to join, but they refuse to visit up close with the Little Mermaid and sort of disown her since they feel betrayed that she chose humans over her own kind and they know they'll never get to see her again. Quite different than the Disney version where they just accept her new form, congratulate the couple and wave goodbye. King Triton even changes her back into human to make her happy. Still, the price of having her family give up on her was worthwhile for the young princess in this tale and finally the day came when the prince decided to confide in her and share his deepest feelings. He tells her about the night of his 16th birthday and how he would have drowned if it wasn't for this mysterious woman whom he'd fallen in love with, a woman that looks strangely similar to the Little Mermaid. The prince then goes on to say that he's given up on finding this woman and the idea that she even exists in the first place. It must have been just a beautiful spirit that rescued him that fateful night. As you can imagine, the mermaid is pretty discouraged over this because she can't say anything to let him know otherwise. Suddenly, it looked as though she wouldn't have to say a word after all. The prince turns to her, looking her in the eyes as he tells her he loves her like a sister. Of course, that doesn't stop him from stringing her along the following months to come. The prince had become very intimate with the little mermaid. He'd rest his head upon her chest, play with her hair, and kiss her at every opportunity. He was constantly throwing her on mixed signals, and so the little mermaid had no choice but to remain hopeful that true love would find a way, until the prince's marriage to another princess was announced. A mermaid's sacrifice. This was an arranged marriage, of course. The prince was very resistant of the idea. Her being royalty didn't mean anything to him. In fact, he tells the Little Mermaid he could never love her based on title and wealth, and that he'd much rather take the mermaid's hand in marriage any day. Yeah, this guy was a real tease. Regardless of his objection, it was still a formality to meet the princess, and so the royal family sets sail for the princess and her nearby kingdom. Upon the prince's arrival, there is an engagement celebration, followed by the unveiling of their princess. The prince gazes upon her beauty for only a moment before exclaiming that she is the woman of his dreams, the ones whose face he had fallen in love with the night of his 16th birthday. This, of course, also happens in the Disney film with Vanessa, aka Ursula in disguise. But in this story, she's not the sea witch, just a normal pretty princess, and she doesn't need a magic seashell necklace to entrance the prince. The two immediately wed, and that night, the little mermaid stood on the side of the prince's ship, deciding whether to kill herself now or wait until the sunrise, when she would eventually become foam. That's when she heard some familiar your voices calling out to her from below. Disney's dark secret. The Little Mermaid's sisters had found her, but they are barely recognizable to her anymore. Their beautiful long hair had been shaved off, leaving all four sisters completely bald, like Ben Diesel bald. They had sold their hair to the sea witch to save their baby sister from her horrible fate. And so the Little Mermaid is happy but for a moment, before her sisters throw a dagger into the deck next to her. She grabs the dagger, but looks as though she has a few follow-up questions. Her sisters explain that in order for her to return to the Sea Kingdom, she would have to kill the prince, whom she loves so dearly. Not painlessly either, but violently. She would have to stab him repeatedly until her legs were completely covered in his blood. Prison redemption style, with 
time quickly running out, the mermaid heads toward the prince's cabin. She peers inside and sees her beloved blissfully sleeping away in the arms of his new wife. She stares at the two newlyweds, then stares down at the dagger in her hand. She looks out the window next to her as the sun begins to emerge from the horizon and then tosses the dagger into the water. She exits, leaving his quarters, and throws herself over the side of the ship. The little mermaid turns the phone becomes one with the sea. No happy ending marriage here. No Little Mermaid part two. No happily ever after? Wait, really? So that's it? No epic battle with the sea witch? No wedding with King Triton and the rest of the mer people in attendance? And the adorable Max wagging his tail and licking your face? Where's the happy ending? Well, there's kind of a happy ending involved, but it's one that's not seen too often in the modern retellings. See, the Little Mermaid goes on to become a daughter of the air, which is essentially something along the lines of a sky goddess. The Little Mermaid had wanted a soul so bad as a reward for her good deeds, she was given the opportunity to earn one. It is explained that the daughters of the air move through our world unseen as they do good deeds for others. After 300 years of good deeds have been completed, the daughter would be granted a human soul. Then, to spice things up, Hans added an extra tidbit to help parents bribe their children into good behavior. According to the fairy tale, if a daughter of the air smiles upon a well-behaved child, takes an entire year off their sentence. But if a naughty child causes her to cry, then an extra day will be added for every tear shed. And that's an attempt to make it better, but in comparison to the graphic violence and utter tragedy that's featured in the rest of the story, I am pretty sure the invisible woman would be the last thing in a child's mind. Heck, I'm still thinking about the dead bodies floating around the kingdom. Seeing that would have set a totally different vibe for the under the sea magical number. Well, there you have it. Thanks for watching Disney's Dark Secrets for the harsh truth behind The Little Mermaid. Did we miss any secrets? Which ones were the darkest? Tell us your thoughts in the comment section below and check out our other videos. Don't forget to subscribe to Channel Federator and click on the bell icon to become part of our notification squad. And remember, Federator loves you.